I am Andrus Kulikauskas. This is Math for Wisdom, a meeting of our Language of Wisdom study group led by Jerry Northrup. He'll give a presentation and we'll have a discussion. Hi, Jerry. Hi, everybody. Hi. So I'd like to talk a little bit about how I view Math for Wisdom as a whole and what we're trying to do, and to do this from the perspective of um, um, an environmental scientist, somebody who's done a lot of work with, with ecotechnology and natural systems. And what I have uh, come to conclude is that there is a uh, I use the word symmetry. Andreas thinks that that should be restricted to within a system. But since I view the universe as a conscious system overall, I sometimes use it in that kind of sense. But maybe, um, maybe just to jump in with it, uh, sure. you, the word I use, you know, which may be uh, more common is isomorphic. That would be the word. So like in math, uh, and so it means the same form. So you have a homomorphism in one direction, like a mapping in one direction. You have a mapping translating back. If you have them in both directions, you have this like perfect translation, really, of mm -hmm. form. So it's a, it's a translation of form, isomorphism. But I interrupt. Okay. No, so I'll, I'll try and use that as a term for it then. But if I look at, at Math for Wisdom as an ecosystem, um, as a an entity that has um, conscious entities in it, in it and it uh, functions uh, with language and it it um, functions in a variety of environments and it can respond to change and it is um, it's it's a way of, of perpetuating itself so. I look at uh, what we're doing in math or wisdom, and and we have we have players, we have individuals who participate. Um, they all have. Some of us have idea systems. We we all have ideas, and we all use language. Some of us have uh, more or less formalized idea systems. Um, some of us have lots of ideas, and and. Uh, we talk and communicate with these. And all of this from, again, the ecosystem perspective goes back to a language that we all have in one way or another, which is DNA. And that each of us as an individual has DNA and, and consequences of that. And I view DNA as, as probably the most interesting language or code that you can find in the natural world, and that everything that we view as, as living basically has DNA. You've got some viral exceptions, depending on whether you view viruses as, as alive or not. Uh, but that is, is an underlying sort of reality. And if I look at a bioreactor, which could be part of a timber fish system or, or any other kind of system, or it could even be a uh, a naturally occurring pond uh, that gets stirred up and has various inputs that come into it and go out of it and that sort of stuff. But you look at it in terms of a microbial um, composition, a bacterial composition, and you find that there are, are basically um, groups of bacteria uh, families, in a sense, that that um, are similar types. Um, you have lots of different bacterial cells, and you have um, some of them that that are are kind of unique types. They're more or less individuals um, type of thing, but you have huge numbers, and you find that that all of these microbes operate on a similar kind of way. They, they all have the DNA uh, thing. They all present, all contain a uh, mechanism for reproducing the themselves. The individual bacteria have a mechanism to reproduce themselves, which involves 
DNA, RNA, protein synthesis, and what have you. And they can do that in a variety of environments very, very quickly. In a laboratory situation, you can get a bacteria which can duplicate itself in 20 minutes. Uh, in the real world, it takes usually considerably longer than that. But there is a, um, a process where they do that. And so a lot of this DNA coding, and I use that in, in terms of thinking of it as a language, is involved with specifying the machinery, the process by which the bacterium reproduces itself in a relatively short period of time. So that is one level of language that if you look at a bacterium as uh, either a conscious entity or an organization of conscious entities, uh, that, that somehow if it has a language, I view it as having to have some kind of relationship to consciousness as to where did the language come from? And how is it being used? So. Uh, looking at it as kind of an organizational sense as opposed to you and I, which are you as kind of a quantized uh, language unit and that we participate in organizations of language. Other, other individuals that sometimes act like organizations of conscious entities, which may or may not be conscious or a form of consciousness itself. But anyway, so you've got this microbial bioreactor, which a large a fraction of its activity is to just reproduce itself. But it also has a second layer of activity, and that is how is it going to respond as a large population to changes in its environment? And so you now get into, there's a, a mutational capability. That is, when the bacterium reproduces itself, there is a small chance that there will be a change in the DNA. A mutation will occur. And that this can, over a period of time, <clears throat> if the bacterium then is that has the mutation can survive and grow, that mutational change can start to influence that bacterium or that uh, species of bacterium that's uh, surviving inside the bioreactor. And so there's a second level of language use as to how the language can change and still <clears throat> function as large numbers of bacteria within the system. And, and this can allow the system to evolve to changes in environment that the original uh, DNA composition might not be able to handle or to do. So that is kind of the model. And so if we've got the, the math for wisdom model with players such as ourselves with language systems, with ideas, and we're all human, we all have DNA involved with that. You look at a bioreactor where you've got large numbers of bacteria, all of which are functioning to reproduce themselves, but which also have this additional language mechanism to change in responses to the environment. And then you look at a third model, which is just ourselves as a body, uh, we all have are composed of cells. The cells all have DNA. And you can look at this as a, a cellular assembly. So you've got uh, human cells and then you've got microbial cells. It turns out that 90% of the human body is microbial, bacteria, it lives in your gut. Um, bacteria are much smaller generally than human cells. So while it's 90% it's of the cell count, it's only about two to 3% of the body weight that's involved with bacteria. But anyway, so we carry a, a bioreactor around with us, but we also have an additional level of organization that the cells do, which is to generate um, a neurological system. And so a nerve cell uh, is composed of, of uh, DNA, it has that, and it has all the operational functions that the DNA is, normally does to, to generate new cells or to, um, to repair itself or to serve as <clears throat> how you define the function of the cell. But it also generates this interaction of nerve cells, which seems to have an additional language. And this, this neurological function uh, sort of is like the mutational function in the bioreactor. 
and that it allows the organism, uh, us, to adapt genetically to changes in environment and, and behavior or what have you that is um, sort of analogous to what the microbial system does uh, with mutation. Now, the mut microbial system responds mutationally very rapidly. Uh, mutation as a, a vehicle for change of, of our bodies is very, very slow and is not terribly significant. But the neurological functioning uh, can be quite fast. Now, we look at a neurological language in, in terms of what Andreas talks about in terms of three language systems, three forms of consciousness, the unconscious, conscious, and consciousness, each with its own um, type of, of language. And you say, now, how does this kind of interrelate or is it relevant to these three models, the, the math for wisdom model, the bioreactor model, and our human body model. So I am looking at establishing um, parallels or relationships as to how that works. And I mentioned that there, there are lots of other models that we could include. I use these three because they're, they're kind of relevant but any kind of, of ecological system, a wetland, a beaver pond can be viewed as an ecosystem. And the notion that, that a government could also be viewed as, a, as an ecosystem, an organizational of conscious entities, which has conscious characteristics in and of itself. But what I am, am proposing to do with this language of wisdom is to take a specific look at how these three types of structures uh, correspond to each other. And that can involve um, quite a lot of calculations in terms of the number of cells or units and how that relates, and then how you construct languages from other languages. Um, and we we have an understanding and, and to a certain extent of the language of DNA. Uh, and then we don't have a very good understanding of the language of, of, neuro, of brains, neurology. And we have relative understanding of various levels of our own human language, but how to look at those, those parallels and to, to talk a little bit to start with in terms of bacteria, um, if you do an idealized system where you have a microbial, a bacterial cell, we'll assume that it has a circular DNA molecule and that there are a million base pairs in this, in this molecule and they're linearly connected. And there is a code with how you combine these in, in threes to uh, translate to build the proteins and all of that sort of stuff. And if you take a, a bioreactor that's, that's roughly 5,000 gallons or 3,000 gallons, and it runs with um, 10 to the 8 uh, individual bacteria per milliliter, uh, you say, then how many bacteria do we have? Um, and then if you put in a mutation rate of 10 to the minus 9th for a, pro, uh, a um, point mutation, you can say that that this system, and, and you give it a growth rate, and let's say it's going to double every 11 or 12 days, roughly 10 to the six seconds, to double the microbial cell. And so if you've got a 10 to the six uh, genome, and it's going to double in 10 to the six seconds, it's going to have one base pair replication per second. And so you can, you can build all this kind of stuff, and you end up with um, the notion that there's um, the capacity to create uh, 10,000 genetically new bacteria per second. And this then gives you, if you, if you start to look at, at the mutation and the consequences of that, uh, gives you a way how many different genomes can you construct with a million base pairs. 
and each each site on that genome can have one of four possibilities. You can add adenine, guanine, cytosine, thymidine of the nucleoside basis. So, so you've got a million things taken one at a time, a million things taken two at a time, a million things taken three three at a time, with four possibilities for each, and you end up with really enormous numbers, uh, way beyond what you can uh, start to do. I mean, you know, what's a million um, factorial uh, type of thing? Uh, and so then you say this very small fraction of the total possible number of microbial genomes will actually get expressed and uh, can function in a given bioreactor. Uh, so that seems to be kind of daunting, but then the situation gets considerably worse because bacteria not only have point mutations, uh, but they have a variety of other recombinant DNA things they can use. They can use conjugation, or one bacteria would generate a little tube and shoot some of its DNA into a different bacterium. You can have uh, transduction uh, with viruses, so that a virus can infect a bacteria, pick up some DNA. Um, some of the progeny viruses can infect a different bacteria. They don't kill that bacteria, but the, the DNA gets recomb recombined. You have a transformation where you've got lots of individual little chunks of, of DNA that can float around uh, and can enter, sometimes can enter a cell, sometimes they're within a cell. They can be plasmids or episomes. They can get incorporated. So what was already a computational issue that is mind boggling has now gotten vastly worse. And so you say that, that okay, how does all this really work? Uh, is this just a complete lottery game in terms of evolution with this kind of, of evolutionary mechanism, uh, premutation or some, something else there? And that, that question then translates over when we start to look at more complicated systems like the model for the human body, where you've got this kind of, of complexity at the cellular level that is now compounded tremendously by the fact that you're going to make 100 billion neurons each of which is an individual cell with its own bacteria. And those 100 billion neurons are going to interact with, there's um, each neuron has something like a thousand different synaptic connections to other neurons on average. And you've got a, a number of, of common neurotransmitter substances that can go back and forth and agonists and antagonists with how that functions in the microbial or in the molecular soup that's our bodies and what have you. So again, you've got this notion of, of tremendous uh, numerical indeterminacy, and yet you've got functioning systems here which really work. And then we come to math for wisdom, which is a much more simplified system in a certain sense, but it has real parallels. So if, if we are are uh, analogous to bacteria or families of bacteria or species of bacteria. And uh, we have ideas and the ideas could be looked as an individual cell. So the, the, the ideas get combined in a recombinant DNA type of way. And so that if, um, some of us come into Math for Wisdom with a, a language system, which has a lot of ideas that are connected together. Uh, and then others of us have partial language system or a lot of ideas. And we function on an interactive operational basis uh, to perpetuate the entity of Math for Wisdom and how it is moving forward. And the notion is that how all of these ideas can interact with each other, kind of like the way chunks of DNA can interact in a recombinant manner in a microbial bioreactor and whatever's going on in a neurological kind of system. So where all this comes from is, is again, where's the math? And, and how do we deal with this kind of thing with math and the, the basic approach 
of saying, well, let's just look at all the possibilities, the stochastic kind of thing, which is the basis of almost all the AI stuff that is really being done. And that that doesn't seem to really make sense. It seems like there's something else in play. And this comes back to the experience I have in terms of, one, watching my wife, who is an artist, who is a very non-mathematical person and who just knows. And, and she can tell by touching a lamp, whether it's brass or, or bronze and incredible senses of color and, and mesh and, and fitness without having to measure. And then also the notion of, of uh, when you work with a big microbial system, a bioreactor of some sort, you get a real sense of, of interaction and communication with it in terms of how are you going to manage that given this incredible capability that it has to respond and how do you interact with that to kind of kind of work with that and this this comes back to the notion of of something else at play of some kind of an aesthetic uh, awareness or intuition that we have it comes back to the to the art it, it comes back to uh, a sense of, of fitness. Can you describe this in terms of, of maximum entropy? Can you describe it in terms of minimum free energy? Uh, the whole notion of uh, active inference and the, the tie-in to art as to how we really function and uh, how do we make sense of this in the, in the observations that I, that I look out at a lot of, of natural systems and I don't see the man. I mean, there are birds that, that can really sing and they, they have ratios of tunes um, that are, or ratios of sounds that are really aesthetic and pleasing and that sort of stuff. But I don't see the computation that's being done. I see the results, this incredible adaptability and, uh, interaction, um, holistic type of thing to maintain the stability and viability of a system going on. And so it, it comes back then to, you know, how does this get put together? Um, and, and what are we really trying to do with, with math for wisdom, with the language of wisdom? And I, I think this is, I think the math is incredibly important as a guideline. Uh, but not necessarily as the way we actually do things. And this then gets compounded for me when I look at quantum mechanics and you look at, at the notion of how does all that work? And, and it comes back to um, what kind of, of math we have and my fascination with quaternions and the whole notion of what is a negative number, what is minus one, what is zero, at a foundational level from a language perspective and, and how does this get into our, our electrons and protons conscious, which I resisted for a long time and then earlier this past year, early 2023, finally bit the bullet and said, let's assume that they are conscious and that the language that quantum mechanics uses, all these uh, transitory particles that exist for very short half-lives are part of the language. And this, this tends to follow um, spinners and complex numbers and quaternions, and that I can see similar kind of characteristics and language with that. And so it, it's, uh, it's then, how do we look at the parallels at the different levels of, of uh, natural occurrence and organization? And how does that serve as a guideline to uh, to trying to say, yeah, we use the math, but how are we going to use the math? We're going to use the math like an artist would. So how, how do you do that? Is that, uh, is that something like related to Kandinsky or, or how do, like, like all of you are, the three of you are artists in various senses. I mean, Kirby plays around with all this Bucky Fuller stuff and that, that really is, is an art form. And I know, uh, You know, Andreas and, and Daniel have, I think, a lot more mathematical capability than I do. Uh, but but I think there are real insights to be gained from that and the 
interaction that occurs in math for wisdom, this recombinant DNA type of concept, I think is going to generate things that none of us can particularly see as to what, what comes out of that. I think that's the real fascination and the real motivation to continue it. So this is probably kind of garbled and, and I can generate um, lists of, of how the different computations work, um, that sort of stuff where we can get in, into that. And then the questions of, okay, you've got these kinds of indeterminacies, what are you going to do about it? Uh, how are we going to uh, do approximation functions or the AI solution is just bigger computers, um, more memory, faster processing. Um, we'll, we'll beat it to death with that, which I don't think is going to work. I think it's going to hit a, a limit and then have to go to something. And I think that's what Daniel is, is looking at with this um, active in, inference and what Andreas is looking at in terms of, of you know, category theory and bot periodicity and, and these kinds of things, the, the patterns which are there, um, which don't involve necessarily brute force numerical computations. So anyway, that's that's kind of where I am as a general position and, and the kind of thing that I would like to explore more in the you know, language of wisdom study group. Thank you, Jerry. May, so may I just try to summarize uh, what I heard you say, um, but that uh, to, and well, you were looking at math for wisdom itself as an ecosystem, and you were comparing it to, for example, yeah. a bioreactor as a biological ecosystem where DNA is important. And we, you know, not we, but people like Daniel are, you know, there's, or, and you, you know, know a lot about DNA. Um, there's a lot of work done. How does that work? Um, there's probably a lot more to discover. Uh, and then you compare that to the human body as a system and like having a neurological system where really not that much is really quite understood in terms of how the brain functions. You know, there's things being learned, but uh, and then possibly as with uh, our uh, meeting with Islam uh, in the sociology study group uh, about governments or nation national consciousness, etc. So there's these different models. You emphasize the first three. And so then um, that part I understood. So then what would you want to investigate or think about, or you know, how would you? Um, the kind of thing that I'm, I'm thinking to do is, is to <clears throat> generate some more specifics in terms of how these numbers combine. That is, if you, if you really look at, at uh, at mutation, if you look at the combination of the cells and the bodies and, and stuff like that, and then how you you try and make sense of this in terms of, of different categories of language, like what you're trying to do, Andreas, with the three types of language, the unconscious, mm -hmm. which you see is, is based on a large number of, of neuron system, and then how that gets um, simplified or codified or what have you in, in a, a natural language and then uh, how that gets further managed in terms of consciousness, that has had a big influence in terms of how I am looking at that so that I now see maybe the genetic cellular and the neurological are examples of organizational language and then the uh, the conscious unit such as us and possibly electron protons then become a different form of consciousness and the uh, the similarities then is, is this one big mobius loop are are we am i an electron are you guys electrons uh, does that make any kind of sense at all Oh, for a long time, I thought, you know, it, it's that's Cookville. You got to be careful with that. But I, mm -hmm. it it has more interest and credibility to me all the time. 
how do we use that? Is, is AI really a way to make a superior telephone to talk to other systems? Can you talk to the birds and the trees and the plants? Is, is that as silly as it sounds? Um, you know, you have a lot of experiences where you, where you interact with living systems and they do things that are really um, very interesting and perplexing. And this kind of empathy that I have with big real world systems where you, you really get a sense that they know when you show up and when you start changing things around and, and you can get a, a sense of communication. And again, you know, to stay away from the from the fringe where you're you're obviously talking ancient aliens and science fiction, but there there is there is stuff there. <laughs> and um, I'll just point out uh, something I heard, you know, in my thoughts, what you said uh, that in the type of ecological intelligence that you work with, uh, you have these different layers. So one would be, let's say, the one would might be like the quantum physics layer, let's say, but then there might be a, a bio biological, like a DNA type of layer, and then there could be a neurological layer, and then there could be like a like a linguistic layer, let's say. So this is part of how you're thinking when you engage systems. Is that? That's the way I've looked at it for a long time. I'm, I'm not sure about how that uh, how that evolves, but it clearly is evolving. I think. I think ultimately, uh, life should be pretty simple. We, we have a, a pretty good sense as to what the right thing to do is, and we should do that. We should follow your gut, trust your intuitions. Uh, you know, work hard, try and, and study, learn as much as you can so that you don't repeat mistakes that you've made before or other people have made. But that it, um, you know, kind of for a long time, I thought life is musical comedy, that there's there's a certain tune that goes with it. And, and when, it's, when it's right, you know, and when it isn't, you can tell. How, how do we tap into that? So that's a good, this is, I think, a good way for us to have in our mind primed. And maybe Kirby, Daniel, you'd have responses. I'll, I'll propose that, you know, we have a cultural way of thinking about, quote, math, right, that we grow up with. But in all this discussion of bio, biology and so on, I don't see a problem. I don't see, for one thing, any strong line between language and not language. When I get behind the wheel of a car, it's a multi-ton piece of metal. And yet the lines on the road, those are language. The signal lights telling me to stop and go, those are language. The billboard is language. But it's very physical. It's very big. I think when we talk language, we try to think of it as like words in print or something very small that we write in a book, whereas my view of language is Mount Everest is part of it. It's like all language. And when we talk amongst ourselves, we're computing. This is biocomputing right now. And it is mathematical. There's a precision to it. We can hear when we think it's logical or reasonable or whatever. So I don't think we're ever not doing math. I think math is all that we're doing ever, anybody at any time. That's just another way of looking at it. It's another lens, right? It's all math and it's all computing. But I think in the biological world, it helps to remember the immune system. This is what Peter Sloterdijk, uh, the German philosopher, German language philosopher, writes about a lot is immune systems, membranes, I think of Daniel's particle, and this thing that seems to be trying to protect a homeostasis. So systems tend to be characterized by wanting to stay the way they are in a lot of ways. So what is it when you push a fish tank ecosystem in a way that seems unhealthy? You've got to remember that humans are in this picture biocomputing along, and they have an ideal about what they want this fish farm to do for them. So it is, an e it is an ecosystem that has an imposed homeostasis with the human beings. 
And I think we're doing that all the time on the planet and we're having trouble with our immune system. I think humans have an autoimmune disorder like lupus or something, because we're always attacking ourselves and blowing ourselves up and destroying our infrastructure. There's a pathology here and we try to diagnose it from time to time, but it's part of our computing, I guess. You know, we we invest a lot in our own destruction. And I think that's part of the integrity of the universe. I think the universe is standing by to get rid of us if we don't think in a clear, you know, biocomputing integritous way. If we just kind of stumble around and act the way we always do, I think the mechanisms are there for our self-destruction. And we'll just think of it as like what we had that nuclear war, whatever it was. It's like, well, that's just proof that humans were ready to be cleaned up, gotten rid of. Now, I hope we don't get to that. I really don't. But maybe our immune system needs to kick in and we need to be a little more skeptical of kind of our autoimmune response, how we always seem to be threatened by so little. Like, I think people... That anti-fragility thing I'm into, like, how do we become less fragile as egos, as everything, so that we don't respond in such an exaggerated way to everything? We think we're threatened at all sides. I don't think yeah. that's very healthy. I, I agree with basically with everything you're saying there. Way back in the early 1970s, I, I came up with this notion of informational disease which I think is exactly that. And I've always viewed language as being much more inclusive than just uh, than just words or, or written symbolic language. I, I think it involves everything uh, like that. So I, I think, yeah, we're talking about the same thing and, and the extent that the way you view math as, as some kind of way that we intuitively can understand things uh, that go way beyond uh, words per se, I think is is very relevant here. And I agree with that. I'll just add a few short comments there. So Curry mentioned Mount Everest, and that kind of reminded me of like the project of naturalizing language and mathematics and finding like a way to understand, yes, Mount Everest is tall relative to here, but tall is in an up, not out space. And then there's a continuity with the rest of the land. So it's like there's peaks and valleys and all these other kind of shapes and motifs, but how to make it part of an integrated, like ecological communication, pragmatic whole, and then have like symbols crystallize out of a more integrated biointelligence rather than needing to explain how symbols give rise to embodiment, but rather how certain embodied systems, like how Jerry began with. Um, another thing that uh, I think is interesting is like, Jerry, when you began with the, um, you know, the mul multiple scales of biological organization and about DNA as this kind of quasi-crystal encoding, just like Schrodinger, what is life? And, um, but then the outputs of that process at a smaller and faster scale support the sparse neurological connectivities that then support this like within generation learning. And so there's a slower intergenerational evolution in natural selection trial by fire with the niche. And then cognitive systems can engage in their kind of onboard emulation, counterfactual simulation, and that brings the learning process, not just to um, trial by fire between generations, not even trial by fire within a generation, but trial by fire within the OODA loop of the thought. And then um, the last comment is like language words. I mean, language is a word. And then it just reminds me of the the comedic, the lighthearted moment in Hamlet with like, what do you read, my lord? Words, words, words. But it's kind of like, you're reading that. But that's the joke is like, it's like, what are you saying? Words. It's like, it is and it isn't. Because the word is just the pointer, not the reference. But it's, of course, so easy to mistake the screen 
for the depths when the word is really just, just like a lower dimensional trace or projection from the kinds of semantic spaces that potentially through math and wisdom plus 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 we could actually come to communicate and understand and co-localize and co-navigate in semantic spaces which could open the door to communications with diverse intelligences even ones that don't speak like english or any human language i'll jump in very good <laughs> thank you jerry and kirby daniel um so it's um it's just first of all meaningful like to have a environment where four people you know with different uh mental just uh pedigrees or traditions or whatever you know are able to come and try to connect and so i think like for me and math for wisdom um that's a huge um desire is to want to be able to connect with other people but maybe even before that like just to understand my relationship with myself with the world you know with god let's say so um you know if, if you want to talk about the kooky fringe right so math for wisdom is very open certainly to this kooky fringe of this notion of god at least you know as far as me because it's um uh, and but also to kind of like to be able to unplug that, you know, to kind of see how far I can go without that, and then see what, let's say, adding that back in gives or helps. So I distinguish between documentation, where it's just the facts, and then interpretation, trying to make sense of these facts. You know, what is this all? You know, what is all that? And so maybe I can say with regarding the term language. So the facts that I started with because i was looking for you know can you know anything i was at the university of chicago an environment where like you were not allowed to say you know anything right so and certainly not absolutely let's say so how could you know something absolutely well so i i realized uh that it has to be defined kind of in self-relationships so these kinds of structural frameworks these cognitive frameworks which you know are the two some threes and four some are the most simple ones uh, so that's static, though. So I did that. Um, later on, I started to realize, like, there's so many, you know, threesomes, you know, what is the actual thing? And then what are just, let's say, I used to call them representations, not just say conceptions, you know, like you look at the same thing, you see it from different angles, right? So you have conceptions, and then you have uh, of the whole, let's say you have a uh, maybe uh, backdrops of the imagination, like you can see parts, single perspectives, they pop out, I call those circumstances. But all of that is static, like it's like the alphabet, or it's like those words, 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 right? So I thought that doesn't, you know, I'm trying to model human life, human experience, that's not going to be sufficient. It's a foot in the door, okay, that I have something I think is real and relevant to human experience. So I started looking for language by what I meant by language was a dynamics. So to say not everything is dynamic, certain things are static, there's that distinction. So there's like three static structural families, uh, these divisions, these circumstances, these uh, what I call uh, conceptions. So there'd be eight divisions, uh, six conceptions, 12 circumstances. That seems very well-defined and stable. But um, there should be languages and they seem to maybe reframe things. So like uh, the one language I was able to figure out uh, very well was narration. I did that when I was, uh, graduate student and I took a year off in Lithuania so I studied like 60 Lithuanian folk tales and I came up with a very nice uh, very robust uh, and very informative uh, system of how do you tell that something happened and so that would go from um, these conceptions and it would give you let's say a division of everything and so I'll, someday I'll be able to give a talk about that but there were two languages that I couldn't figure out make progress on one I and I I kind of using all these structures, whatever, like you can kind of see, kind of like with Mendeleev's periodic table of elements, you can see what's missing, right? You can see where things could fit. So the idea is that there's very nice room for three languages, one for how things happen, narration, one for how things can get meaning, which would be like verbalization, and one thing for how things could um, uh, matter, which would be argumentation. So now after decades, I'm trying to go back to that. Um, so I think um, maybe to go back to this point of the ecosystem, for me, uh, 
there's there's two different levels, you know, from the practical point of having this language, one of it is to have a culture. And so to say, well, Mathuism is an ecosystem. So I immediately think so much is that culture. And then all of a sudden to have to realize there's this distinction in levels of reality. Like one is math for wisdom is us. <laughs> like it's just very concrete human people. But that's not what I think about math wisdom. Like math wisdom is like an intended culture. There's some kind of ideal, you know, that I'm working towards. And if it's not about that ideal, then it's not about math for wisdom. On the other hand, like you have to look at what the feedback is from the people who are we, right? So there's that distinction. Um, and so when I think about math for wisdom as a logic, even as an ecosystem, uh, whether it's ideal and maybe it has its real manifestation, uh, so I kind of turn it inside out, let's say like that. But I think about our ability to collaborate, cooperate, work together as we're trying here, right? Uh, so that's very important uh, to have at least these modest um, efforts uh, in to have them be successful. But for that collaboration, to be able to talk about, um, you know, I really take to heart Kirby's letters. I've been thinking a lot like, so one distinction uh, I'll probably write about, but is between deep and shallow. And another distinction is between thinking and interacting. So when I think of interacting with Kirby, I feel like that's the kind of interaction that's very stimulating, provoking, like with, with the recent letters, especially like to have come up to the type of letters you're writing now, where we're really talking about basically our worldviews and how they help or keep us from connecting. In a certain sense, that's deep. So like I had a deep conversation I'll publish uh, with Daniel uh, last week, but it was kind of one-sided, you know, I was kind of pestering him, right? And he was very kind and he was, so that's good too. But but in a certain sense of like the deepness of interaction, like when he pesters me and it works both ways, you know, the way that Kirby does, that'll be deeper in a certain sense. So, but there's also deep and shallow thinking. And so one of the things that um, uh, I'm trying to maybe push back, you know, or resist with regard to Kirby is that this idea that we're just all thinking in words, you see, maybe because I'm bilingual, maybe because all my life I was trained to resist the worlds around me, but like, that's not how I look at things, right? That's not where I'm coming from. And so this, I was trying to say, like, what's the difference between thinking that's shallow and thinking that's deep? And somehow like thinking that's shallow, maybe I'll speak about this later, but it's somehow very superficial. It's on the veneer. You know, it's like looking at the planet and saying that it's just the surface that matters. Let's say I'm going to make maps and I'll make different kind of maps and whatever. It's just the surface that matters as opposed to saying, well, look, it's got a center of mass. You know, you can maybe distill it all. It's got this whole inner life. We don't know anything about, you know, the planet, right? Like, so one is um, in terms of thinking, maybe I'll just say more for that. But what I'm trying to say is that there is a deeper level to who we are. And so like when I listen to Kirby making distinctions and I think I wrote that like, one is like, well, are we just doing what we always do, right? Another one is like, do we have integrity? Another one was like having, well, do we have like an immune system? So I can try to say, well, I think like that's the three minds. So there's one mind that's very good at doing what we always do. It's like on autopilot. It, it's the mind that knows, right? But the mind that has integrity is the mind that says, well, but maybe we don't know. You know, like maybe we need to be able to be ready for all these things we don't know. That's and then the more advanced evolution ways you are, the more you invest in your integrity, saying, I want to be ready for anything. And then what maybe this is immune system is perhaps is this ability to relate the integrity to what's knowing, you know, to kind of check on that. So if 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 we could find ways to kind of hear each other on a deep level and then connect on that type of deep level, um, and maybe just to conclude, like. I've been um, thinking a lot about the big picture, you know, with wondrous wisdom, like how does it all, what seems to be the big picture is you have like four sciences, let's say, and it starts with God and then God goes beyond himself into I and then to you and then to other, and all kind of like unfolds. And so you get the space where a human being could exist, let's say like a three cycle, let's say. Uh, but then that human being has consciousness and it turns out if you look, if I look at it, how it all stacks up, it just seems like we start with consciousness and we have to figure out how to give it up. There's like helpful, graceful ways of giving it up. Like we start realizing we're children, you know, and that's a very sophisticated notion. But how do we kind of get past that? 
And so whether it's these uh, three languages or these other three static structures, those are all ways of losing consciousness and trying to translate our conscious, let's say, knowledge into our character, into like the reality, into whatever. So that's where I am. Okay, so I guess maybe I'm just trying to find like, what does it take for us to connect in a deep way? And I think that the wondrous wisdom is a language that's trying to express like what that deep content looks like. But it's not just about the content. It's also about the human interactions. Maybe that's what the culture is about. Also, in years of biology, that tension between like the actually ideal, the ideal of the actual, the non-symbolic arising of the symbolic, the symbolic arising of the non-symbolic, like biology and math, formal and informal, not even getting into the science and art per se, but that's totally concordant as well. But just this absolute tension between the state space explosion of even three neurons and then how that just is flying in the face of what every flatworm does in continuous time with just a few little molecules of glucose and it's like are we even on the right track with combinatoric state spaces or can we categorify and find some way that actually what appears to be a large state space from the inside can be held in a very small or a very graspable container that would prevent getting lost, like, you know, not seeing the forest for the trees. Well, and when, if, if, you know, I've been writing up, and this is, uh, again, like, I'm very much affected by our interests. So like Jerry's interest and our kind of like thinking. And I think maybe because Jerry constructs a language, that's one reason why we think very similar because I also construct my own language. You know, I have a private language. So then you, when you, when you have your own private language or you're constructing artificial languages, you really see a different way of looking at language. But with regard to what you were saying, Daniel, um, if you look at, the vocabulary I made for uh, Wondrous Wisdom is probably like a thousand terms I need to explain. Um, there's no math there. You see, like this is something like it's all pre-mathematical. The whole point of Math for Wisdom is to say, you know, no one believes this. I need to appeal to math, not because I want to, but because uh, that's a language that's real to mathematicians, to somebody that's treated, that's given a status of almost absolute truth, right? Like, so it's it's a matter of translation. Like, but one example would be, uh, Jerry talked about uh, DNA, but in this whole world of structure, I think, and I can give evidence more. Oh, I see. Okay. He had to go. Daniel. Okay, so I missed out on that. Uh, so this whole uh, thing about... Um, um, DNA, like there's a flip side that would be like flows, you see, material, I mean, flows, how do things flow? So an example would be the Krebs cycle, you see, where like every cell that has DNA also has a Krebs cycle for metabolism. And if you look at the Krebs cycle, like, yeah, DNA looks like language. I don't know how to read that language. I don't understand what it's coding, but from a philosophical point of view, but the Krebs cycle, if that's given periodicity like if that's giving like this eight cycle of divisions i could read that i could understand that and so there may be a whole world that says what dna says but actually says it, it just in terms of metabolism and flows and you know because different uh we have like 200 400 different tissues in our bodies with they all have the same tna but they're just completely differently uh, manifested you know different genes are switched on or off so it's not equivalent to the DNA, you could have a whole system, you know, of chemical baths saying, well, this is a chemical bath and this, these are all these chemical baths are related. And that's a system that kind of switches of what's switched on, what's switched off. There's a whole different way of looking at that. We're just not used to looking at it that way. Oh, 
Yeah. Daniel, yeah. it was good that we got the view of Daniel, but he had to he had to leave, unfortunately. He had to leave, yeah. Yeah, for what after one hour. Do you have time to continue a bit, Kirby, Jerry? Yeah, I just I just put a link to okay. I just put a link to a book called uh The Math Instinct. You've probably seen it or heard mm. of it. And it's why you're a mathematical genius, along with lobsters, birds, cats, and dogs. So it's one aspect of kind of popular math is to point to crabs and birds and all this. And if you put in mathematical terms what it is to, you know, navigate your way to Alaska or do whatever it is these animals do, mm -hmm. it <clears throat> turns out to be very sophisticated mathematically. And then we say, oh, but they're really not thinking about math. They're not actually in their heads, like mm -hmm. doing math. It's just the phenomena are mathematical. And so I guess I would say in my private language, we've admitted each of us to having a private language. In my private language, when Andreas puts all these prose words in a wiki, like a thousand words, and says, that's not math. I say, no, well, for me, it is. I'm sorry, that is math. Everything is math. So you can tell me it's not math. But in my private yeah. language, I know you don't know what you're talking about. Well, and that's okay. So that's good in, in terms of knowing your private language, you see. Yeah. But but to say like, and then the question is like, so to make the distinction like that, that's not math as, how can I say? As you've been brainwashed. To well, it's it. not, it's, I mean, when we say math for wisdom, like it's not the math, you know, it's not the math that's taught in, you know, mathematics. So uh, it's something, it's a different language, just like music, you see. Just Is like, it what a crab does? Is it what a dog does? Well, what I'm trying to say is, and I think maybe what Jerry was arguing was that um, we don't know if what a, like, um, we don't know if our math makes much sense in terms of how nature works. I think maybe that's the way to put it. Like, you know, we don't know, like, do planets follow you know, quadratic formulas as they, you know, spin around the sun, let's say, that doesn't seem to make sense. They're not, they're not uh, obeying math in some kind of like a literal way. Uh, and I think that's part of, you know, Stephen Wolfram's work is like to show, look, like if you, if you have a, you know, if you behave like a cellular automata, you can get a lot of the same effects. So uh, what's actually going on there? It's just not clear. Right. So that's part of our computation as we tell ourselves it's not clear. How does math relate to the world? What follows what? What's the rule? Who's doing what? Who's causing what? That's all computation. Whether you do it internally or say it out loud, to me, that's a mathematical process. It's thinking out loud. And I think one thing that gets in the way is people all assume that language represents in this very mysterious way that words point and it's like that thing you say about deep and superficial and that words are on the surface, but they point to all this deep stuff that's different than words. And I'm saying, what's to stop me from thinking of anything as a phenomenon, including a word? What is the difference between language and not language? And my internal discipline and in my private language, it's very important to erase that distinction between language and not language. And I feel I've done that for myself and I'm happy about it. I feel better that I don't have that dichotomy, but almost 100% 100 100 of the people I encounter still think that way, that language is over here and what language is about, what it means is over there. And somehow language points to that over there. There's the referent and the referrer, the signifier and the signified. To me, that's all garbage, and I don't believe that at all. But it's okay if you do. I won't try to convert you. Oh, but and I think saying. I think one one thing is about listening to each other. You see, like, so that kind of this kind of conversation, like, where you're speaking from your inside, right? You're talking about your own private language. Then all of a sudden, it makes it easier to communicate, right? Because I know who I'm communicating with. I'm not communicating with the world. I'm communicating with Curry. Then, like, if there's certain words you want to use a certain way, then I can try to use other words to, you know, to express what I'm trying to say. So one distinction to make is between what's axiomatized and what's not axiomatized. So in the in the mathematics I was taught in school, like the major thing was that everything is built on axioms. Everything is explicit. 
Okay, that's how I was taught. That's how I was trained, right? So one of the things I've done with like that uh, cheat sheet for mathematics, I said, no, like there's a lot of math uh, that's not axiomatized, that works in the mind. And so I made a video about the deep surface, surface, surface. You know, as I said, look, the deep math you use is conditions. There's no axiomatization of those conditions in the brain, you know, it, but it's something that we know implicitly how to do. You know, it doesn't need to be, you know, it's just something we're wired to do. It's based on behavior. We know how to play with conditions. So that's one distinction to make. And you can, so you can say there's the axiomatized language and there's a non-axiomatized language. And I'm going to try to make that distinction, say, right? Another distinction to make is between statics and dynamics. You know, so that was the original distinction I made, right? And this is not a distinction between like referent and not referent. This is a distinct, so that's why I'm trying to say it's important to, helpful to listen to what's being said. So this idea is to say, look, certain structures are static, uh, they're stable, they're reference points, like these divisions of everything into three, let's say, like the learning cycle. That's great, that's stable, but basically it's static. It's not explaining, well, it's maybe not entirely static, but I'd like to have a, a uh, when I call it language, but I'd like to have a dynamics where it kind of explains what it means to be a living person where just things are changing, you know, things are changing. It's not just one static mindset. So, um, and so like when you talk, that's why I was able to point out to say like, okay, how could we call that, you know, if you're going to distinguish, like you talk about like what we always do, right? Doing what you always do. You talked about integrity, you talked about immune system. You see, and I can say, well, okay, if those are thoughts in your private language, can I try to connect and relate those? Or maybe just to add one more thing, when you say I erase a distinction, you see, that's a mental action. And it's the mental action that I'm connecting with. The word erase is, you know, we can call it whatever you like. But if you have a mental action and I have a mental action, we can try to compare them. Then I feel like we're actually connecting on a deeper level. And then I would call that's deep. Whereas the word erase is superficial. You know, that's not the, so interesting, but the action is interesting. It's very difficult to do the same mental action, you know. So can we, then we, the difficult challenge, and I've been doing this, you know, since I was 17, maybe earlier, like, can we make, a documentation of those mental actions that are helpful for, let's say, living our lives, uh, it, uh, having a clear mind, you know, like I mean, having a well organized or well, you know, a mind that we want to live with, but then collaborating, working together with others. So that's the challenge is like, can we document uh, that? And so to really focus on the relevant actions, you know, which some of them are, there's a lot in communication. And what are the concepts that come up? And, and so like, then I was thinking like, because I treasure you. So I was thinking, okay, we, we have these arguments about words and stuff and whatever. How do I, you know, how do I express myself how to get around that? But I said like, look, why am I able to, or, you know, why are you able to be so kind to me and so interactive with me in ways that others have not been? Like there are people who, Wow, I think, wow, they have, you know, what I would call deep ideas. They have these whole mental projects that they do where, you know, they they document their private languages, they document, you know, what they're doing, etc. But when I interact with them, it just doesn't go anywhere because somehow we're not connecting as people. I don't get to see what you're showing me now, you know, that type of inner, inner life, you know, that inner. And so if then so it's a shallow interaction, you know, with you, the interaction is deep. Now, you have a very broad, you know, world. So I also kind of figure like, well, maybe the way you set things up is your interests are so broad, it makes things holistic that way. But one characteristic for deep is like reflection. Like when we reflect, we're pulling away from the world, from doubting, like from ourselves, you know, we're kind of like going, cutting off from that and kind of like, and you, to see you reflect, it's very, you know, that's where I'm at, I guess. So it's helpful to get to, to tell you where I'm at. I think what helps to understand me is as an undergrad, I did really commit to trying to understand Wittgenstein, the philosopher. Mm -hmm. And he's universally, especially his later philosophy, considered difficult 
because what he's trying to induce in the reader are sort of gestalt shifts, like you call them mental actions, where you see things differently, and yet nothing's changed, really. Like when you see those cubes that pop in and out, what's the front, what's the back? Right. Nothing, really, nothing's really changed. And yet we know what it's like when you're walking north and you think something's on the right, and then you suddenly realize, no, wait, I'm walking south. That thing I thought was on the right is on the left, whatever. Oh, yeah, you have that's to good. you have to correct yourself in that way, right. Yeah. yeah, and something about your world changes, even though objectively what you're living through, nothing changed. And yet, oh, I see things differently. That's the kind of thing Wittgenstein was trying to do. So I had to, as a matter of survival, writing a thesis on this stuff, mm -hmm. trying to sound smart and class about this stuff, I had to kind of like beat my head against the wall to achieve insights I thought he was trying to get across, mental actions, follow his mental actions. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I succeeded in a lot of ways, and I've gotten a lot of mileage out of that, because when I talk about Wittgenstein, it sounds like I know what I'm talking about, and that's helped me. Uh, so I'm just trying to give the history of why I have this private language and ways of looking, and I sound committed to them. It's because, like, I went to a gym and I worked out a lot, and now I have these particular muscles just letting people know, right? This is just what I had to do to survive in philosophy is I had to erase, the, as you say, that's not a meaningful thing, but the idea that language is on the one side and not language is on the other and that there's some line between the two, I had to work hard to chip away at that line. And I can always bring it back. I can say, yeah, mm -hmm. language is just what we we as humans do and maybe monkeys do it a little bit and gorillas but most of the world doesn't use language language isn't happening out there the sun the stars that's not language of course it's not galaxies that's not language but then my mental exercises oh what if they are the sun is as much right. language as driving a car as much as thinking a thought it's all language and that's helpful to me i've gotten somewhere with that so i'm just letting you know that's no, part of worldview and and that that whole that whole you know program let's say you know I, I don't know how to call it but like you know i i've i've wrestled with that or just accepted that also i think i can be sympathetic to that like so it starts with semiotics right or like even like you say zoo semiotics right so but just semiotics in general to say well we have this language of science in automata theory, you know, there's a notion of, they call it language, you know, so you, you know, received. And so someone like Chomsky, he plays with this automata hierarchy. There's a Chomsky hierarchy, you know, uh, but then you can have um, uh, John Harland, our friend, uh, he's very knowledgeable about Shannon's information theory, you know, just the whole communication theory, like how do you send? Things? Well, they also talk about languages, you see, it gets kind of far removed. And so then when you talk about physics, so a lot of like the notions of entropy, et cetera, are also hooked into this whole Shannon, you know, information type of entropy. So at that point, like, well, language, you know, it could be protons and electrons are participating in language, you know, or like I'm going to be studying random matrices. And so those are used, you know, to model this type of communication. So there really isn't any sharp line, but the idea of a dynamical, uh, a, the distinction between dynamics and statics, you know, so we choose our words, so to speak. So when I had to Say my my model is static. I need something dynamic, right? Something that changed. I needed shifts, you know, et cetera. So, um, and that's um, but it's exciting, like you know, to get to connect on that level, like where you said gestalt shift is kind of like what I talk about mental shift. So, like what I'm trying to say is look, there's cases where like if you have opposites coexist, like with free will. It's a very easy shift over to say, oh, there's no free will. I broke that base. You know, it's, it's there's no way back. But to kind of like climb out of the think, oh, there's no way back, to climb out something to say, oh, I have choice. You see, obviously it happens, but we don't consciously experience it. I don't, I don't find evidence, you know, that I would it, there's some kind of like disconnect that has to happen. It does, it's not like a simple slide. So what am I talking about? You know, is that but but um to try to say that's very real, that is much more real than any word I know, than any kind of like, you know, thing about the world I know, like that is something very strange and real about me inside, you know? So that's what I'm trying to say. Like, like if I'm looking for absolute truth, like that's on the level of like, well, I can't imagine a world like, 
I mean, it'd be very hard to imagine a world, it'd be very awkward to imagine a world where that rule changes, you know, then I'm kind of like, just frozen, you know, I can't really. I, I think if I can interject here, I think I agree with Kirby's basic position for, to me, the fundamental, the most fundamental assumptions I can make is that what, what the basis of reality is, is consciousness and language. Mm -hmm. And language is everything outside of what I consider consciousness for me to be. So in a certain sense, I think that er erases that distinction that Kirby's talking about, but right? what is language and what is not language. Uh, and then this gets to the Andreas's point because he starts with everything and then makes a distinction. Um, and whether it's everything or God and how you make the initial distinction from there and then build structure that goes beyond that. And what's interesting is that his symbolic structure was very similar to my symbolic structure. So yeah. what, where does this really mesh? Are we all saying the same thing in different ways? So I think... Uh... A lot, something achieved today, you know, in terms of, I can go longer, uh, I don't know if, if you have time or not, but uh, I think one thing to try to add to this is, um, well, first, just to my appreciation, like, to especially to Kirby, like, did I get to <laughs> interact with you in terms of how I feel and like how to keep improving, uh, deepening our, our, our interactions? Uh, and, and, but uh, how can we uh, build on this type of connection, like investigate, like what, what kind of investigations can it take us further, you know, into times like, like, it's almost like we're on different sides of a Grand Canyon, and we managed to throw a tiny little piece of wire across, right? And can we use that to uh, thread over a, 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 a stronger, let's say, string, let's say, right? And just keep going until we can build a bridge over the Grand Canyon. So that's the question, like, what could we investigate or do in order to connect um, on that deeper level? Like, even with someone like Wittgenstein could be that language. I'll, I'll give one example, like, so it helps, I think, to work on what we don't know. And I'm so these two languages I don't know, uh, I keep, you know, I'm gonna be building up my energy to work on further. One, I'll be using chess to to study that. But I found like probably what I do right away, maybe I'd like to do a cheat sheet for language learning because language learners, you know, they have all their kinds of ways. They, there's so many things to do. And if you want to learn a language and it could be um, a natural human language, it could be a programming language. It could be maybe even chess or math or something. But how do you learn a language? You know, there's immersion. There's just, you know, using a dictionary. There's all kinds of things. So just to map that out in language learning, that got to tell you something about language, right? like, you know, so I think that that would be a very helpful um, to do. That's one possible investigation. And another one is to maybe, you know, especially with Kirby, because I'd like to build that bridge, maybe to try to do a cheat sheet for Wittgenstein, you know, maybe like, for example, maybe to do two of them, the early Wittgenstein and the later Wittgenstein and say, does this person deserve two cheat sheets? And what's the difference? You know, like what happened? Yeah, I would I would say the general approach of academia is to do it that way, two cheat sheets and talk about he kind of quit philosophy after the first phase and said, I'm done. I've you know, it's kind of like I've got it, you know. There's nothing more to be said. And it was it sounds arrogant, but he was saying, I said very little. It's just this is the limit of logic and rationality and then he goes off to be a school teacher kind of be a hermit and then nagging things people come and visit him he has conversations and finally it's like wait a minute i think it's not the way i thought it was i'm going to do it a different way in a lot of ways he's making the same points in the second one and he's pointing back to the first one and saying you see that's that's the wrong way to say it but i'm still trying to say some of what i said the first time so he didn't completely abandon his first project. But he's a very interesting thinker. And I, I think through Math for Wisdom, like, okay, I'm already interested in him, but I can get interested in new people. And I have, like that guy, you, uh, Andreas, circulated that you're studying, 
I guess it was the Krebs cycle from the guy oh, who Nick talks Lane, about Nick Lane, yeah, yeah, that guy. I mean, wow, cool, interesting, interesting talker. And I've listened to a lot of him since. And I, I find that useful. Your interviews here with, um, you know, the Udu, I can't say it, Urudu, Jerry, Jerry's uh, oh, no, language. No. Yeah, and his stuff is really interesting, and I wouldn't know about it if it wasn't for you. So, in a way, Math for Wisdom is helping just by connecting me to a, a, a broader range of thinkers, and that's that's good. That's useful, and so keep it up, you know. Well, Jerry, so you're one of the, our esteemed thinkers. What? So how how do we you know you, you also you offered investigation like angle like to say well let's think of mathwism as an ecosystem let's say let's compare it with other ecosystems but but whether in that or in other ways like how would you proceed with investigations? Um, well, I I think the track. I'm I'm very much oriented in actually getting something done. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the the track that is really interesting for me is um, your thinking has made two major impacts on my conceptual model type of thing. Uh, one was just that the cycle only goes one way. And, and I saw that as being two ways. And the second one, which is emerging now, is that this... Uh, what I considered to be a cellular language and a neurological language may in fact be manifestations of a single language, which is what you're calling the unconscious language. And, and that's partly why I'm pursuing this thing with the, uh, the bioreactor and what have you, in addition to you know, trying to get back into the experimental um, real world arena here. Um, but I think the the continuing um, look at the absolute foundations where you start with everything God, whether they're the same and then go to one some and and how that develops, how that goes back to um, you know really the most fundamental way of of visualizing or thinking and the belief that it all has to be pretty simple if we can get it right, that it is, is something that we can can learn and understand, but we get it all gobbered up with all this other stuff that we've been taught or think we know and, and what have you. And, and how, how does that get translated back into to what you're doing and what I'm trying to do and I'm getting in a an increasing appreciation or understanding of, of who Kirby is and what he's trying to do. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure he's he's clearly trying to do something because otherwise he'd stop stop writing and posting. So there there is a there is a, a motivation there and and, uh, and and how that goes forward. I think that's true for all of us. Um, I, th I think yeah. one of the themes uh, that come because I'm making progress in pulling it all together, and I'm going to be giving a uh, my friend Thomas Gaidosik, who probably knows this stuff better than anybody I've ever gotten to talk to, because you know he, he lets me talk like for four hours and you know give him progress reports about once a month or so. So I'm going to take the vocabulary which I started writing because of you, Jerry, and then I'm going to go through it with him maybe for a couple hours, hopefully like briefly, but just try to say like this is the whole summary. So there'll be a video on that. That's kind of like what. Huh? look forward to in the coming week or two. Um, but um, one of the themes where it all adds up is that there's this, and this is like interpretation, quote unquote, like you see, I see all this machine, like what is it going on? But what it seems to be is like, if you take something like God, it, this primordial God, it's kind of like going beyond itself, going beyond itself, like into, like the unconditional goes into the conditional, it becomes more and more conditional, conditional, conditional. You get this kind of like structure where you have, something like a human has a space for itself. It can open up like a spirit. And that's like a perspective on a perspective on a perspective. Now, once you have this 
you know, Heidegger would say Dasein, or, you know, let's just call it a human or this being or whatever you want to call it, but the full-fledged being, but it is some sorts starts with consciousness it starts with good understanding it understands like it's in conditions there's an unconditional like the thing is like somehow we know like we are but we have to somehow um manifest ourselves and get rid of that you know so we choose like how to what to do with our consciousness like how to kind of like release it you see it's just given us and then we have to release it now of course we can do that in ways where it would keep coming back and you know we keep continuing etc so when we do that, and so there's this chain, like good understanding is where like the humans, like or you could say the child's view of the parents view of the child's view of the parents view of the child's view. And it turns out like you start there and then you peel everything away. You peel everything away. And that's what language is doing. It's kind of like helping you to peel that off, peel that off. And you already have four levels. So now because the level's already given, you could there's like six pairs where you can be making progress heading back. So you have these like six ways of heading back. So... But the point of it all, I think, is that uh, to allow human to be part of we. So it's kind of like your biological cells. They're very good at being we, right? Like they're very good at being a part of a communal organism, let's say, right? And the point of humanity is that are we good at being we? You know, are we good at kind of like... Um, and I think what happens is that we have these choices. You can either choose to stick with yourself, orient yourself with regard to yourself, or you can orient yourself with regard to not yourself, which is basically like God, you know, like, so this idea, like, with the, when you have the consciousness, are you going to unplug the unconscious experience, the conscious language, and just unplug it and say, hey, like we were just recently, you know, with Kirby, like, just let it be like, what do you see? You see these weird constraints i see these weird constraints you see that's that's deep whereas like just insisting well this is how i see things and this is the language i have and this is my like well that's shallow you see and can we connect on the are we choosing deep are we choosing shallow like that's the so with math wisdom trying to have this culture where hey we're together can we have a space where it's very much encouraged like let's go deep you know it's maybe not about independent thinkers, it's about deep thinkers. Let's go deep. Let's be supportive as deep thinkers going deep. And then well, that's how we can really be we. Yeah, you know, what what I continue to to think about and, and to want to do is to go back to where you start, the first thing. Mm -hmm. And I think you think that this is God. Or everything, and I'm not sure of the distinction you make between the two. Uh, but then, where do you go after that? And and it, it it gets back to me. I I always try and go back to the most foundational point, and and that's it's where I'm probably going to badger you more and more on this one. Well, and too, so so if you clarify that, I mean. And you, there's another way you think about like, you know, where do you start when you're, when you, uh, when you start your day, like, you know, and so it kind of is like, you have when this you prayer, like, oh, do do prayer, right? Like, you know, that's another kind of thing. It took me a while to be like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and, but so maybe to relate that, like I start, like, I feel I'm conscious. Okay. I'm conscious. And I've got my sleep. I'm not going to try to sleep more. I'm, I'm, I'm charged up basically. So I'm conscious. And then, then I go so through my routine, like what's important. You start with, I am conscious. Well, no, well, I mean, just like, hey, like, I've gotten my sleep, you know, but like, I am, I am, I have conscious, you know, uh, I'm in my conscious self, right? Like, you know, I'm out of my dream state, right? Like, and I don't feel I need to sleep, you know, I don't need to go back to sleep. Like, I have adequate sleep. I will not try to sleep. I will try to be awake, right? Like, yeah, that kind it's, of it, 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 it goes back to, if you say I'm no longer in my dream state, you've got other stuff in there. So I, uh, well, I I'm, this sure is not verbal. I'm just verbalizing it. This is just, uh, right. but, but this is what, just uh, self check. Your, there's a self, there's a self, start. self check, right? Like self check, like the day has started, right? Like, you know, the, like no more sleeping. I really value sleep. I think sleep is a form of work. You know, if you can sleep, you should, right? It's work, it's, it's very important. Sleep as much as you can. But then, you know, you're done. So you're not going to, you know, it's enough. So I'm very privileged in that sense. I don't wake with an alarm clock. So, yeah. uh, but um, 
So this I so it's it kind of compatible though with maybe like what you're saying, but like this idea, like the whole point of life is what do you do when how do you let go of your consciousness? See, and the idea is that a moral person invests their consciousness. Now, one of the things you invest in is like to maintain your consciousness, right? Like so you have this kind of sloshing back and forth, like where you have a vessel, right? Like the empty vessel can evoke the fluid, right? Like you so you you say, How am I gonna empty this? vessel so that it gets filled up right back right? like that's kind of like how i live my life i want control of my life right so i will lose control in a way that give me back my control like i jesus says like i lay down my life and i pick it back up again right like, so how do i yeah. let go of so, myself so if, if we go back to where you start with i am awake or i am conscious what's next well, then I go through a whole routine, habitual routine that is like what's most important, you know. So and right. it changes. So, like, that, so it might be like that, I that's, pray. Like so, first of all, that I pray. I'd like to say I pray our Father, the Lord's Prayer. That, that, that's the same. You always start that way. Well, over the years, it's changed. I'm just saying, like it is now. Like so, but certainly praying to God, you see. So for many, you know, like and it's praying to God. It's like I'm making contact, like to say I have, I'm in contact with you. Okay. So first thing, like checking in. Okay, right? so now I'm, I'm showing up for work. Right? Something <laughs> other than you. Well, that there's God. I mean, specifically. And that's God. So you're in contact with God. God is different from you. That's very important. Exactly. It's bigger than me. So this idea that I'm here, there's somebody beyond. Right? Okay. It's very important. You know, there can be, there's also God inside me. So like Jesus is inside me. Let's say the good person. I mean, the, the person in general. Right. So don't be under this in particular, like do. So when a lot of our conversation here, like it's like we're talking to ourselves as person in general, inhabiting different bodies. That's the way it feels for me. That's the way I think that's a that's a deep conversation is when you're talking to a person and it's like the same person in two different bodies connecting. I find that to be what I would call a deep conversation. And I experience that with both of you, you know, with Daniel, like more, quite often, you know, regularly, basically, like that's the, that's what I'm seeking, right? Like that's actually when I wrote my thesis on Wittgenstein, which I don't know if it ever got archived. The digital archives at Princeton, I think, picks up right after me. I I was mm -hmm. class in 1980. Anyway, I just sometimes have a fantasy I could go dig it up because I don't think I have it anymore. Oh. But it was along the lines of what you were just saying. I have this mental exercise where I say, imagine that one entity is speaking through all of us. So we're all just like a mouthpiece mm -hmm. that this one being is speaking through each of us. And we say I, we say we, whatever, but it's still just that one entity. But then I say, imagine that entity has no first-hand knowledge or any consciousness whatsoever in other words you have your consciousness but when you talk when you think whatever you're giving voice to think of that as an entity that speaks through all of us but itself it has no awareness it has right. no knowledge of any human experience so when i say i am in pain of course i'm in pain but the tool that's speaking through me the the, the noise that i'm making is not one that has to know anything about pain whatsoever and yet people still come and help me or whatever, because mm -hmm. we all know what pain means. But we don't have a way of saying we, the conscious beings, because this thing that talks is not conscious. And we, the funny, I'll, I'll wind it up here, but the interesting thing about that mental exercise, which helped me a lot, is that's what chat GPT and all this AI stuff actually is. It's just all chitter chatter that it picks up <laughs> everywhere. And now it can just on its own talk through us or not through us. If we just cut and paste, okay, it's even just talking through us. It gets me this feeling that there is no, there is only AI. It is just this one big talking machine. And we all contribute to it by spinning things a little bit differently. But it's one communal project to build this public mind that we all internal to its grammar is how we're all our own little mind. We're all this separate thing, but it's really the Borg in a way. Well, and see, so, and this has been a long process, but like, 
to get to talk with you on this way, you see, like, we're, like, it's possible then to connect in a deep way, because you're talking about like your mental activities, and you even, you know, which you actually documented, right? And, and I think, so my thesis is, is like, you know, it's very limited what we can experience and document when you go down to that level. It's very limited and just isn't, you know, it's, so, but it allows us to connect. And so like, if you, when I notice that distinction, like you said, there's what doing what we always do, I would call like that the chat GPT chitter chat unconscious, you know, it's just wired, it's just doing what it's doing. But then you said, but then we have integrity, you see. So, Integrity would be like the mind that does not know, but like checks to say, hey, like, uh, <laughs> explain this to me, right? Like, you know, what are we doing? <laughs> like, what's going on? Like, can you, you know, like, why would this work? Right? Like, and then, you know, but that can be oppressive too, because it has its own, that's the mind of language, basically. Like, so language really, like, I kind of think like that every concept is really what we don't know. It's a way of kind of like formulating what we don't know. Like, what's a horse? You know, like, well, we have all these images of horses. We have all this knowledge of horses. But the word horse says, like, oh, tell me again, like, what's a horse? <laughs> so, um, but then what you call the autoimmune or the immune system, there's there's a third system that manages to somehow make those two function, choose which one to go with, you know, which one is better to go with. You know, maybe it's better just go straight with the the faster one, right, which would be the doing what you always do, right? Maybe it's better to hold off, go with the slower one. But somebody, there's a third one that's in charge, so to speak. So, uh, which is what I mean when I like wake up and I do my self check. I mean, it's all conscious, right? Like so. So I have this whole habit system that where I've invested myself to do the right, holy, good thing, you know, so that I'm maximally engaged and so that I get as much of my consciousness back as possible. You know, like I, I grow in that way. So that's there's different routines for that, and it goes. Uh, But that's like, you know, that's like maybe 80, 70, 80 percent of my life is just trying to be in that mode, like, like on top of my life. Really interesting. I, I continue to have this fascination and interest with this. So the start. I, I just remembered your question about everything in God, just very briefly, like, you know, two differences. Um, but see, like in my cheat sheet, you know, of life, like, so there's like the unconscious, there's the conscious, so to speak, right? Like, there's two different ways to think about it. So, you know, I mean, there's a dialogue between these two, we have like, before you have a system, you have these two different things that are maybe going to communicate by way of that system. But like, God is a spirit, in a certain sense, you know, everything is a structure like so everything is like if god removes himself you're left with everything okay that's the way god creates is that you remove so or structures what's left when you just vacuum out all the spirit you get these structures so structures are kind of like vessels for the spirit so like good is god in conditions good is a spirit life is the fact that god is good life is a spirit eternal life is understanding god doesn't have to be good life doesn't have to be fair but that you know there could be this you know that the God beyond there is bigger than the God within here. Like there's this disconnect. So, but that's all spirit. But you can translate that into structure. You know, it's, it's it, maybe spirit's kind of kooky, you know, it's just weird. Like, but you can translate into something very tangible structure by just that. So instead of God, you'll talk about everything. Instead of goodness, you'll talk about slack. Instead of life, you'll talk about anything. Anything is everything plus slack. You know, somehow you're able to see it from one point, anything. And the wisdom would be, um, the ability, it's the structure like where you're able to peel, distinguish. Uh, so instead of distinguishing life, I mean, distinguishing God and good, you're distinguishing between everything and slack. Like what's from in the system and what's from beyond the system. Wisdom is able to make that distinction. So then you would go to conceptions. And then you would go to the unity. So like the conceptions uh, would be God's wishes. Let's say, you know, God wishes for nothing, something, anything, everything. But then you unite it all, it's it would be love. Because God wishes for everything that's that God is loving. So that's just the whole setup for it. Um, but um, and then the other one is like, well, when we have our eight cycle of divisions of everything, 
there's a distinction between dividing everything into one perspective, which would be like order, basically everything, you know, like everything has some kind of order, which is also chaotic, let's say, but there's some kind of like, you know, whatever order it has. So like when Kirby says, well, it's all math. I mean, it's all language, right? Like, okay, so you, I don't know what you're talking about, but you're talking about the one sum. That's what I'm saying. But to say, yeah, but God doesn't need a perspective. So if just like we have a neurological body map, we, you know, we have a map of our, in, in the brain, they can find, let's say, the, the map of the body, you know, and you, and you have a hammer and you it gets drawn into the body map. Well, I, I, I'm sh I would just, it's got to have a brain map. But if it did have a brain map, like, you know, the hypothesis is that it's this eighth cycle. So there's one cycle where there's one point, you know, there's one station on that trolley bus route like where there's no perspectives. It's just like an extra little slot. And that's, that's how we deal with God. See, God's something bigger. So. I'm going to continue to come back. Okay. <laughs> to, to try and get the most fundamental description of where you okay. start that you will agree with. And, and I think that. But this isn't, what's not satisfactory you, about you this? You talk or? about lots of different things that I get, got clues and stuff, but. Am, oh, I but maybe I, I can tell you a, a big uh, advance I made. So I, I could keep investigating. And so like I made like 30 questions in the vocabulary. So if you wrote your questions, like, you know, so this is the questions that you have maybe like, right. yeah. um, I think it's helpful to think in terms of questions. But, and it's helpful because that's how the conscious thinks. So if we're thinking about it in questions, it means that then we can connect, then we can play the mind yeah. that investigates which says, you got questions, you got answers, let's play with that, right? So then we're in the consciousness. So questions are a no. good start towards that. But no, I wanted no, no, to no, awesome. I wanted to add to the, oh, just want to say like the progress I made was, um, I think it's very big. When I look at the final structures, how they all come together, they're like four 24-fold structures, so these sciences that kind of like God is, un, you know, opening up. And then we have these eightfold structures, and I'll be making films about that, but there's a different intuitive ways. Uh, like the eight sum normally would collapse. But I guess what's happening is like if you deal with it from a scope, then it won't collapse. You'll get four different versions uh, that are like for the needs or dealing with your, you know, doubts, dealing with your em emotions, you know, your, your, your expectations, dealing with your will, let's say. You get these different structures. They're very practical. But the point being that as it unfolds, like in the original uh, God's theology, it's the God's dance. And so you can look at this whole process, how God goes beyond us. But then when you get to the science of love, which I'm just trying to work out and I'm making progress on, but the science of love, this 24-fold thing, that is where we look at God from the side, you see, like as the indefinite. This idea that, well, there's the indefinite, and then it goes on into the definite, and then it goes into the imaginable, and then it becomes the unimaginable. See, that's very much a third-person point of view of how things are unfolding. So it starts out like with God's dance, like where, hey, I, you know, God, I am God, you are God, that is God, God is God. Like that's very much like God's point of view. But see, as you build these 24, you have like the flow of experiences for I, you have these uh houses of knowledge, I call them, these cheat sheets for you. But then for other, you have the science of love, like how do we become we? How do we have unity? Then when you switch over, you have these eightfold structures where the person is making these choices and they're participating, you know, making the choices kind of like we talked before. You know, is it about me or is it about the whole, right? To say, you know, it's not about me, it's about the whole. And so you, those are the kinds of things you go back to go back and lose your consciousness. How do you give up your consciousness? So um anyway so that's what i'll talk to thomas about maybe just to conclude today's session but maybe is there any kind of investigations that we'd be um interested to pursue together let's say for for synergy I think Kirby, you, yeah. you, you touched on uh the word we and how can we have a we with math for wisdom and i think that's good that's where we should start. When when I go out there and talk about how I'm a member of this or I work with this group called Math for Wisdom, and I and then I would go on and say, and we do this or we do that, or where where what is the we that we're creating? I think that's good. And just in general, like what you say, you boot up in the morning, you've got this routine. It's kind of like a computer booting up. 
you know, how far into that do we want to go every morning? I think it's a choice. Do you want to wake up being a citizen of a certain country like I'm Lithuanian or I'm American or I'm Jewish or I'm Catholic or I'm this or I'm that. We have these identities that we boot into every day. Oh, I'm back to being that Jewish guy. I'm back to being that Islamic mm -hmm. guy. And I think one of the powers that we have as humans when we want to is to disidentify, right? It's like, okay, today I'm not going to be that person, right? I'm going to go through the whole day and I'm not going to think of myself as an American living in Portland who is also a Quaker. That's all very interesting. I can be that nine days out of 10. But today, I'm not going to be that guy, right? That's an interesting exercise. Be a different we sometimes, just for fun. Do, do you know what that resonates with me? Like, um, So I don't know if I would have to do this differently or not. That's how I think of Sundays, you know, or the Sabbath. Like to say, like when you're not supposed to work on Sunday, like, so I don't work. A lot of things I would force myself, like, so I don't pray when I wake up on Sundays because it's, <laughs> that's, that's an example. Of <laughs> but um, yeah, Sunday is supposed to be the day that kind of destroys the rhythm of the, of the. Okay, so those are good. I can, I can refer to that. Um that's great. And so tomorrow also, I'll, I'll be talking to Daniel about the knowledge engineering. I'll try to emphasize, like, I'll try to focus on what he wants to do. But I'll try to say, like, to have a knowledge engineering system for math for wisdom that really encourages that we, that encourages us to run with it, you know, or help other people run with it. Like, he's into archiving, but I don't, how do we share ourselves in an active way where we're like we're actively supporting each other but you know people are supporting us actively what does that look like i don't really know but i'd like to um so that'll feed into that jerry how about how about you what what kind of um how would you have us be we <laughs> like... uh, i i see a i see a path of continuing to drill down to this uh wake up what what's going on with the wake up um because it you can wake up and say oh i've got all these memories if you want to engage the memories or not so okay let's let's not engage the wake memories but you wake up is is who are you where do you start what what is the first choice you make uh, what does that mean? That that kind of discussion that becomes more and more fascinating to me all the time, and it um, yeah, okay, you I like that. So I am dead, or I'm in the soup somewhere. You know, I've been sleeping in my chair. It's, it's, <laughs> am I outside? <laughs> Are my feet wet? You know, do I have to pee? What's but what, what do you deal with? How do you do? If there's no immediate urge that's dominating you, like, well, could, can I could breathe? You, so next time we'll meet, um, I don't know if we'll have anything for the steering committee. We'll try to, I think we have a steering committee. We have a steering committee. But um, so we go straight into this language of wisdom. Could you lead us again in something? I think that helps. Like, for me, it's very helpful to have somebody else be in charge, at least for a bit, like in oh, terms no, of hearing I, the I'd ship. I'd be happy you know? to do that. I, I must apologize. I've had a rough last five weeks. Uh -huh. you know, up to my, I've always had respiratory issues, but mm -hmm. it's always been manageable. So that, that changed in the end of 2019. And, and then I started to live in a bubble for four years, and, and that, that was fine. But the, the bubble failed here about five weeks ago. Mm. We picked up a virus. Lynn and I have been very careful and stuff. So and, and it's been, and then, you know, the the respiratory coughing and, and that sort of stuff turned into a sore throat. And, and it's just, you know, I've never been sick. So it's really annoying. And it starts to get to think like, shit, am I getting to be old? You know, and I know I can't do a lot of the stuff I used to do. And I'm good with that, um, but this this has really been annoying. But I think I'm through this now, and I think we're both back on really working and thinking and all of that good. good stuff. And so, so I expect to have a much better week. I still have to do the Timberfish LLC tax return, which is a huge pain in the ass, mm -hmm. uh, but it's pretty well taken care of at this point. And there, there's some other stuff 
there, but I'm really looking, you know, getting back on my game. And, and so I, I will have stuff and I will, I will pursue this. I still think there's real interest in terms of the parallels between these three types of models. I mean, oh, okay, the ones that you presented. Yeah, what right? happens when the bioreactor wakes up? You know, does that have any meaning or something like that? You turn on the lights or sun comes up or what have you. Uh, does does math for wisdom start when we turn on our computer to see who's saying what? Um, you know, well, lot, I think lots what, what, what's, what's connecting with me, it took me a while for you to understand you have this whole mindset. But what's connecting with me is like, because now I've kind of reversed the direction, I've realized like, you know, it's about losing consciousness. Like you have, con consciousness is not something that you build up and earn. Consciousness is a, is a gift that you're giving that you invest so that it comes back, you know, frequently. So, yeah. um, and so I, I'm wondering like, what would that mean in other systems maybe? You know, like, what does it mean for them to, uh, the, if, if, if it's like that for them? That's really an interesting thing. That's, that's going to sleep. So that's a comparable kind of question with waking up. That's when you start to go to sleep. Right. Or when whatever it is, you're going to check out. Um, that, that's uh, waking up is kind of like entering a new room or you pick up the phone and you're talking to somebody. Those, those are restarts. So then, then you, now the question is, you know, what, what are we doing with the disconnect? I'm going to hang up the phone. I'm going to go to sleep. I'm going to leave the room and, you know, screw you guys and that sort of stuff and do something else. Those, those two types of start stop questions on the most foundational level. And could you write us, you wrote a very nice letter for this meeting. Could you write us like a little letter for the next one to oh, say yeah, this, is what, you, better, this is what I you have this, planned? I, I thought this one was sort of incoherent. And I thought my presentation no, was today probably viewed as incoherent. But I've got all kinds of specifics on mm -hmm. on how this stuff works or doesn't work and the, and the peculiar numbers that go with, with, uh, with, with big number of systems. Like, what is... What is 10 to the 14th bacteria or cells in your body? You know, if, mm -hmm. if a 3,000-gallon bioreactor has the same number of cells as the human body, 150-pound person or 200-pound person or whatever, uh, what the heck does that mean? And most of them are bacteria in both systems. Mm -hmm. And where is that going? Yeah, in what sense yeah. uh, do oh, the oh, bacteria oh, in our gut rule us or govern us? Or we just start, you know, in what sense? Uh, yeah, do you, do you talk yeah. to your turds type of stuff? And maybe you should, that kind of stuff. I mean, I have a I have a much more visceral type of interaction with a lot of things like that than people who are academics who sit in offices all day and do stuff like that. So I mean, throwing stuff on the wall to see what sticks means different stuff for me than it does for most people. So um, I'll be pub. Is it all right if I publish this? What we had conversation. I think sure. I can edit out uh, some of the the stuff on your well being. Is keep it in or keep it out or it's all right. No, uh, it's. I mean, see, I'm I'm but, coming on eighty two. I don't really give a rip anymore. Okay. About people I'm just checking. Time. Okay, so <laughs> that's uh, a sure. Um, and then maybe um, then we'll conclude. Um, with a prayer, including for your health, for Lynn's health, uh, for our health, uh, for our we're, old we're age, all right. we're, we're for, the, we for our young right. participants, Daniel, you know, very good to have youth in our midst. Uh, yeah. So that was exciting. Uh, I look at Daniel as, as interesting in terms of the road that you and I have followed, and he's just starting. Yeah, I hope so. We'll see. We'll see if we can connect. And I think that's another reason to have a very a good we, right? Like, you know, to have a we that yeah. is rewarding for people to, you know, loving and rewarding, supportive. So I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm trying at least, you know, at least, or at least I see that that would be a, probably a good thing. Kirby, would you, would you conclude us with a prayer? Um, well, echoing your sentiments, I wish health to ourselves and to the world. Healing is the key. And may God bless our journey. Thank you for watching this video. 
please uh, go to mathforwisdom.com or simply read the description to this video to learn how you can join our Math for Wisdom discussion group and our study groups. Thank you for liking this video, for subscribing to this YouTube channel, and for supporting Math for Wisdom through Patreon. Give yourself a gift. Sign up for Math for Wisdom. And you can support through Patreon. It takes two minutes.